Hi and welcome. Today we're going to talk about an introduction to security. The overall agenda today in this course is who am I? Introduction to myself. Talk about what is security, what is front end, and what what is back end. Funny questions like is there security on the front end, back end security, how to communicate security, and a small thing for you developers called chain analysis. So my name is Daniel Ilibek, I'm 40 years old and my current uh, education is I'm doing a master's at a university in Denmark called Aalborg University and I'm getting halfway at the moment. So I have a YouTube channel which is the one you're looking at right now and a webpage called Security in Mind. Please visit my webpage and uh, get an overview of my current courses which is also located here on YouTube. One of my projects at the moment is that I want to incorporate IT security in all the Danish education. It is a big mouthful, but I'm doing my best and I'm pretty sure that I'm going to have a success at some point later. So let's talk about a little more important topic. What is security? So Bruce Schreiner uh, once said we wouldn't have to spend so much time, money and effort on network security if we didn't have such bad software security. So I guess this is a little starter for you guys. Whenever you think about security, think about all the bad software we have and all the security holes, all the breaks, all the hackers, all the articles, news posts you, you get in the news. Um, that's the reason why you want to have secure software. So how should we talk about security? First of all, we need to focus on different kind of areas about security. We have network analysis, for example, we have penetration testing, incident response, ISMS, information security, management system implementation, it's a long thing, yeah? Code analysis, secure programming, and of course, other things like physical security, human security, and so on. So this is just a small list for you to get started with the idea, what is security? So how to, to talk about security, how to um, think about security whenever you want, let's say, a developer. The thing is, no matter if you are a developer or you are a, a person that's just interested in becoming better at security, you can use this drawing that I show right now on, on, on the video. And you have something called a context, which is spelled in Danish, and I'm sorry, it's spelled with a C and so on in English. I just forgot to, yeah, write in English. Sorry for that. So you have an input, you have a system, you have an output. So whenever you have your system, you also need to verify what is your context and how does, does the system operate in that context. Normal systems could be placed and located in a server park or cloud service or your home server. It could also be a a iron thing uh, put into the ground where the car, car drives to read the number plates. So that context definitely say to me that there's slight chance that a car will hit it, so it needs to be robust, okay? If it's uh, another physical thing, like you have a door, so the whole system is the door, the input is, well, someone going in and out the door, or the key, for example, and the output is basically the same in this case when it's a door. However, what, how can we define security for a door? What is its weaknesses and so on? The definition we're going to work with is work with about security is called the ability of a system to satisfy its goals in the presence of an adversary. So whenever we have a system, let's go back to the door scenario and the door is a system. So the ability of the door to satisfy its goals. So the goal of the door is to open and close, to be shut, to be opened again, to put a key in it, to press its handle and so on. That's the whole functionality of a door. Well, I guess most doors, right? In the presence of an adversary. So wh who could be, be interested in breaking into uh, through the door, for example? So whenever you're, you're interested in, in, in breaking into a door, you probably want to kick it, you want to hit it, you want to uh, put your hammer to it, you want to put different kind of tools on it to verify how secure it is. So that is a definition of security that can be used for any system. For example, if you take a web page, 
and the web page is the system, the ability of the web page to satisfy its goals. So let's say it's um, it's a web page that that sells stuff, uh, toilet paper. <laughs> that the web page selling toilet paper. So that the all goal is to sell a lot of toilet paper. All right then. So how do we make sure that the the website is selling a lot of toilet paper? How do we make sure that the that the system is not broken in any sort of way? So the input to the system would be users putting an input. Uh, it could be credit card information. It could be malicious input. And the output of the system is what the system gives you after you press the button of sending something. The system does something with your input and gives you something back. It could be like a, a receipt or or different kind of things. So how do how do we secure the input and the output inside the system? And the context in this case is that the web page is on the World Wide Web, which is the most exposed channel in the world. So um, that was a small introduction to how we can um, think about security and what security is. So let's talk about what is front end and what is back end. This is of course a bit more for the IT guys than the physical and human and social engineering parts of security and physical as well. So what is front end and what is back end? Front end is usually what we talk about through a web browser. This is not the case that all front ends is about web browsers. It could be any terminal, it could be a tablet, it could be a program running on your phone, many different things. Now, I just took into the account that it's a lot easier to talk about something that we all know. So. I'm talking about a web browser because that is one of the most used programs these days on all computers. So on the front end, you usually find stuff like JavaScript, HTML, CSS, images, and text. If you don't know what that is, don't worry too much because it's just the technology is used on the browser to draw the web page. I know it sounds weird drawing the web page, but a browser, really what a browser is, it's a big drawing program that draws the graphics from images and rules and some code, creating some effects and some hover effects and mouse effects and all kinds of different things. This is of course a slideshow made for my school. So if you're a school, please feel free to use it. You can also download it. I put the link in the description below. It's from my webpage. So the next question should be asked, is there security on the front end? Uh, before I change the slide to the next page, I'm going to say this is a very discussed topic and I usually see it on new students that they believe that there is a lot of security on the front end to be uh, taken care of and the reality is, well, it's quite different. So let's change the slide. The short answer is no, there is no security on the front end. The front end is all about HTML, CSS, JavaScript, images, and text. Basically, that's it, right? So whatever whatever you see in your browser is sent from the server, from the web page system, whatever you're gonna call it, to you whenever you clicked and requested the content. Uh, either you typed in the URL address dot 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 whatever dot com, or you clicked the link, or you, you have a hyperlink you click on. Anyways, you requested the content from the server and you're getting sent these five technologies back. So I hear many developers, and this is for your developers uh, right now, why is a JavaScript solution not secure? So the thing is, JavaScript can be altered on the front end. I'm not saying JavaScript cannot be a part of a secure system. So don't, don't think that JavaScript can, cannot be used as a part of a secure system. Of course it can. Um, but the thing is with JavaScript that it is located on the front end and it can be altered. So if you have any security meshes, sanitizing functionalities or whatever you have on the front end, it could basically just be bypassed by the user because it is on the browser of the user. It's called the front end and that is fully interactable uh, on the front end and keep it altered 100%. So it is a not secure way of creating your applications. Never trust front end data. That is the uh, core fundamental of security. Treat front end data as tainted data. So 
tainted is a way of saying this is dirty, this is bad data, data. it is um, malicious. So that is of course something we need to look at when we could come to the backend part. The long answer is still no. However, there is a possibility to achieve something called cross-site scripting on front end, which is gonna be talked about on the next page. This is a bit abstract for you guys, if you are new to security, but there is a way for, for front end um, for the front end to have something called cross-site scripting. Now, if you don't know what cross-site scripting is all about, uh, don't worry too much, because then you're probably not a developer. If you're not a developer, you can fast forward a bit and, and, and go on to the next uh, slideshow. Uh, however, it's probably not a bad idea to hear this. So, let's assume that we have a, um, a front-end cross script vulnerability. The example could be that we that we have a parameter which could be seen in the exploit example around here, exploit example, where we have a URL called site slash something, you know, I've, it could be .com, <laughs> and you have a page and a parameter equals something, and you can be you can put something inside that parameter which could be a JavaScript, and if that is being interpreted on the front end. Um, it could, in theory, and there is actually a CVE, which is Common Weakness in Oration Web Page, which is the link that I have up here. If you want to have the full documentation and the proof of what I'm saying, then you go to that link and you can see what this is all about. It's very technical, so if you're not a developer or a tech insider, I would definitely not say this is a good web page for you to go to at the moment. So. That could be the exploit example. A fix would be to sanitize the data in the JavaScript. So didn't I just say that you can just bypass it? Yes, that is true. But the overall image is that whenever people is requesting a website, uh, the legitimate users are not trying to bypass JavaScript to get a vulnerability. They probably just use the web page as it's intended to be used. So that would actually eliminate the cross script error if you sanitize the data in the JavaScript. So, yes, I think you should switch the slideshow now and go to what is backend. Backend can be many things. It could be written with a language called C Sharp, PHP, Java, C, Python, C++, and so on. There's numerous different kind of languages you can use, even JavaScript these days. So databases and whatever server that runs stuff on the services, email services, FTP services, whatever, it's on the back end, it's called the computer, the, the, the system that runs the actual web page, for example, in this case, that is what is called back end. So security on the back end is of course a primer. All security will be placed on the back end and should always be placed in the back end. If you have any security measures on the front end, make sure to implement them just as well and probably even better on the back end. So the front end will just be usability or to catch the, the common 10 out of 11 stupid mistakes, however you're gonna put it. Just make sure that you put all and the same security measures on the back end as well. Um, yeah, that's about it. So how to communicate security? The, the, this is a difficult one. There are different ways you can try and communicate security, but we all know the problem with the developer, the, 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 the technical minded uh, person that's gonna go to uh, the boss and say, listen, I, I need to talk about security. We need more resources. We, we you know, this, this is already starting to like, oh, the boss gonna say no, okay? So how to communicate security, how to talk about it. Let's say you, you actually, got the budget, you, I mean, not got it, but you, you got the resources to implement security. How would you implement it in your company? How would you talk about it? So the way to talk about it could be using something called the CIA triad. The CIA triad is just three common security goals among a whole lot of them. Different kinds of security goals could be non-interference, it could be intrusion detection, intrusion prevention, it could be um, access control matrices, it could be Bella Padula, it could be beeper model, it could be many different kinds of things, you know. If what I said didn't make a lot of sense, you know, don't don't worry too much because 
This is just an introductory course. And what I think you should mind on is, is looking at the, the thing called the CIA triad. The CIA triad is a way to communicate security in a very efficient and non-technical way. It consists of three letters called C for confidentiality, I for integrity, and A for availability. These are just three different security goals of a system. So think back and look for the context. Think about your system in the, in the squares from earlier in the slideshow. We have some input, we have the system, we have the output, and what is the context of that system? Okay, so when you define that, you, you can talk about the next part is how do we keep our secrets secret? That is what is confidentiality is all about. It could be personal or identifiable information that you want to keep secret. It could be passwords and so on. So how would you keep passwords secure? I'm pretty sure most developers would say something like, oh, we need to hash them in the database and use something called salt, maybe even mention something called pepper. And many different kinds of things could be mentioned in this particular area called confidentiality. However, it is all about keeping them secrets, secrets. How would you keep a secret? That is a very difficult thing, actually. Difficult, more difficult to think. Try and, 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 and if you're a teacher, ask your students that. How would you keep a secret secret? And make them think about it for 50 minutes and see what they say. Very interesting. So integrity is the second part. It is about securing, preserving authority of data. Uh, the most important part is only authorized change to, to the data allowed. So um, you should be the only one, the owner of the account that should be allowed to um, alter your data. So you should be able to add and delete whatever data to the record that you're trying to edit. It could be a bank account and personal data, whatever. Think about it when uh, that your neighbor Bob, or whatever the name of your neighbor is, uh, could could access your bank account or your personal information on your um, city council hall, or whatever it's called where you live, and just edit it and, 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 and access it. That would be breaking its integrity. So confidentiality and integrity kind of go hand in hand when you think about it. Whenever you have a web system and um, uh, let's say it's a <clears throat> debate forum where you write questions and get answers from some other interested tech people, it's very normal that you you have some password you log in with. So that's a confidentiality part. In, in essence, not all of it. Logging is not just confidentiality. There are many different things that goes under confidentiality and the same goes for integrity it is not just about having access to database but in, in in very simple systems it could be just that however you need to think about how do we keep the secret secrets and how do we authorize only uh, authorized uh, personnel to change uh, change the data owned by them availability kind of stands alone it is a uh, difficult to explain but availability is all about I'm going to read the text, ensure that users can access data in a timely manner. Only legitimate users, of course. So if you have a breakdown, you, your server or whatever, you should make sure that you can always access your data. How, how would you make sure that if, if you're under a DDoS attack, how would you make sure that your, your users can access the system? It's a difficult question to answer. Lots of technical stuff lies into the availability question so not something that we go go into however make uh, make to the to the point that um, availability is very important if you have no availability you don't need confidentiality and integrity because nothing is available which kind of means that hmm, you just your system is down so that's the thing so the next part we're going to talk about is something called taint analysis. It's going to be a simplified version. Also, this video is getting quite long for a quick introduction to, to, part of, to parts of cybersecurity. About that, in the link in the description below, I'm going to put a link to other videos on my channel that is also about cybersecurity, which is going to go a bit more in depth about cybersecurity. I have an introductory course to cybersecurity here on YouTube, which I'm also going to link to. This is for the developers only. So if you're not a developer, you can you can uh, stop the video now and go and click the links below and watch some other videos about cybersecurity. 
A simple way to analyze your code is to use something called taint analysis. It is used to find untrusted sources and to write better code. Now, that is a good thing. So you're a developer, you want to write better code, and you want to want to find your untrusted sources. A static taint analysis is done by hand and eye coordination. So it's a, it's, it's a manual thing that's just time consuming. Assume that you have uh, 5,000 lines of code. Looking through all of them manually just going to take a lot of time. Well, that is what a static taint analysis is all about. What you look for is three simple things. You look for something called a source, something called sanitize or filter, depending on what you want to prefer to call it, and something called a sink. Now, the source is something uh, that is described as an input from the front end, for example. It could be UL variables, form data, JavaScript sent data through AJAX or whatever method. It could also be databases or REST APIs you read from. It can be um, sockets and whatever network connection, anything that's coming into your code that you're not directly responsible for, it is something called a source, which is also the input. Sanitize or filter is a function or method that cleans untrusted data and makes it trustable. So whenever you have some source or some input, you want to make sure to sanitize it, sanitize it before you go to the sink. And the sync is the output to the user. It sends data out of your own context. So whenever you output data, you save data to database, you put data to a circuit, you send data back to the client for the view, for the HTML part, that is the sync. It's called output source, sanitize, and syncs. That is the three terms you're going to think about whenever you're going to do something called static taint analysis. So let's look at this part of code. This is PHP, and we have a PHP starting tag and an echo get name. So that is echoing out a UL HTTP get variable called name. Echo in PHP means output it to the user. So whatever, uh, whoever is requesting this page will see the, in, uh, the content of the variable called name in the browser. Okay, so... Um, Get name is the direct input from the front end, so that is a source. The echo is outputting data away from the context, so that is a sync. So already now we have, we have a source and we have a sync. So we should talk about what is wrong with this piece of code and why should we change it. What we need to do is viewed below. We need to wrap it into our sense. In this case, we call the sanitize, and I put some colors on it. It's it's uh, orange, and the name of it could be many different things. Now, this is just to illustrate the whole idea of having a sanitizer that you sanitize before your output. This is a nested way of doing it, but you can also put them on the each individual line. So, tennis sanitize first, save it in in the, in the same variable or new variable, and then echo that out to the next context. So you will hear me say context a lot, which is why you need to focus on context-based solutions. Okay, so um, I think I kind of set this in a way, but I'm gonna reset again. So we have a sanitize method called sanitize in the top. Um, Whatever you need to do is make sure that you think about the context you're outputting to. If you're outputting to a browser, you probably need to do something called HTML entities. Uh, well, you need to create whatever special characters to HTML entities, which is a replace. Um, it, it's a um, whatever you're gonna call it. It's um, um, it's a, a set of different characters that represent the special character that you're going to escape or replace so you don't execute the code in the browser. Uh, think about a JavaScript and that's converted to HTML entities will be uh, the, the lower than will be and LT semicolon for LT lower than so it's ampersand LT semicolon and for the greater uh, than uh, Special character, it's going to be ampersand GT for greater than and a semicolon. 
and different kind of things will be replaced. There's also a, uh, something called HTML entities for um, copyright characters and different kind of things. You can look at that if you just go to Google and write HTML entities and you will get a lot of hits from that. Depending on what your output is, you need to sanitize accordingly. So that basically means that you could go, if if you're coding PHP, you can use the link below here. It's it's going to PHP .net manual uh, filters uh, sanitize PHP. And with that, you can you can read about different kind of sanit sanitation rules uh, to use for your context. Another example here is is asking you a question: Is this code tainted? So and looking at the code, we see that we have a function called get name that basically returns a HTTP get variable called name. If it, if it doesn't exist, it returns the, the string called unknown. The say hello uh, function calls the get name function. And in the bottom, I am taking and calling the say hello. And that's it. So is this code tainted, tainted or not? If yes, why? And if no, um, why? So the answer to this question is yes, it is tainted because we already, and you already saw it, there is no sanitation call in this code. We would of course need, of course, need to do something like this from the prior slide, where we wrap our last call before outputting it to the user with a sanitize call, so we sanitize our data accordingly to the context. Now, please make sure that you think about sanitizing just before your output. So whatever code is in between the source, the input, everything that code does, if it's an algorithm that works with the data in some way, well, you of course need to verify that the data is workable, but that's not about security. That's more like about mm, don't break the program. So maybe you to use some try catches, whatever if sentences to verify the data's um, integrity. However, just before you call the say hello function or the method, when we're going to call it, make sure to do a sanitize call. In this case, it's PHP. You should wrap it in a method called HTML entities or HTML escape charts. All right, so that was my brief introduction uh, for a semi-technical slash developer slash project leader, technical project leader about cybersecurity and a brief introduction to a tool called Taint Analysis, how to find security flaws in your code. So I hope to see you again and um, have a nice day. Mm -hmm.